opened up well, right? Good morning, Kensington. Go ahead. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to start this service off with some singing and giving thanks to God. Come on, let's clap our hands like this. Come on. That's it. Yeah.
at today. Woo! Let the words of this next song encourage you. Listen. I know who I am Cause I know who you are The cross of salvation Was only the start Now I am chosen Free and forgiven have a future and it's worth the living I was made to be tend in a grave I was called by name born and raised back to life again I was made for more oh it sounds good come on sing it if you know it why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way? I know I am yours. I was made for more. Here we go. I know who I am. Cause I know who you are. The cross of
days back to life again and I was made for more so why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way I know I am yours and I was made for more like you were made for more. Yes, hallelujah. And I'm so glad while you're already standing, I want you to take a moment, look at somebody behind you or in front of you and greet them and let them know if you've done everything you wanted to do this summer. you take off really fast so it looks cool. All right, what do I do with my hands? Just uh, lean, lean, yeah, lean, yeah, that's good, do that. Cool. Hey everyone, welcome back to Lessons from the Lake. This week's video is brought to you by short-term mission trips, because every trip should be short. Today's lesson is about how to pack your car for the lake. Come take a look. First things first, you're gonna want a 1990s to early 2000s Subaru, very crucial. Secondly, get some nice rope. The strong stuff, lots of braids, comes apart, sometimes it's not necessary. Tarp, don't get your floaties, get it on there tight. Gonna get in, slam that door so it closes, and then you just hit it. for that guy like he's gonna need a break after summer <laughs> like we really put him through it this year so you guys my name is Michelle McCoy I am part of the K kids team here at the Troy campus and um, there's so much going on in this building right now like we're getting ready for school and just things are really ramping up but that is not what short-term mission trips look like in any way they're a little bit more purposeful well thought out um, this summer we've been highlighting one of our um, one of our global partners every week. And if you've seen that on um, Instagram or on Facebook, you get a lot of information that way. But what we're really looking for is for you to prayerfully step into something. So maybe you're a prayer partner, like somebody who prays consistently for one or two of the, our global partners. Or maybe you're giving financially. But another way to step into this is to go on a short-term mission trip. I, I can be very dramatic. I don't want to be dramatic at this moment, but seriously, the trips that I have gone on have made a change in my life and the way that I do things, the way that I think about people, places, and things that I do. So um, I really encourage you to um, go on the website. If you haven't yet gone on, if you haven't gone on your social media this summer, there's a lot out there, but the global partners part is really, really worth looking into. So highly encourage you to go to kensingtonchurch.org and check out the mission trips that are coming up for the next year. Second, again, the drama is going to kick in. Baptism is next weekend. You guys, I know it is such an awesome um, experience. If you are considering being baptized, if you haven't been before, and you're like, you know, I'm not sure, I don't know, please come and talk with one of us. Snag us in the lobby or talk with somebody at the hub. Um, if you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about, like why baptism, what is it? Again, please come and ask us. We would love to talk with you about what it is, why it is, all of the things. But if you have been baptized, please, next week, come and support these people who have made a decision to follow Jesus. This is a decision, decision that changes lives. So please come next week and just clap and cheer and support and be a part of a really awesome experience. But only come at 11. There will be no 9 o'clock service next week. So 
don't come then. As, you know, sleep in a little bit, have an extra cup of coffee, grab your lawn chair, and then come out at 11 o'clock clock out on the lawn, and we'll um, worship together and just... Really, I'm so excited about next weekend. I think it's going to be really awesome. So next weekend, also, there is no kids programming at all. Birth through high school, everybody out there together. It's got, you're nodding. I see you. Yeah, it's going to be really fun. It's going to be an adventure. I'm super excited. But you guys, today, I'm excited to, um, we've got Linda Linnaeus, and, uh, who is our school partners director here, and she's got a guest with her. This is Kathy Lowy. Right? Yay. She's a second grade teacher at Harrington Elementary in Pontiac. And um, if you don't know about school partners, this is literally partnering with schools to support staff and students, whether it's like encouraging words or really coming in with tutors and school supplies. So, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank can, you. Can you tell us a little bit about your school or the school district in general, whatever you know best about the students, the families, and what you do there? Well, I am a second grade teacher. Um, I will be beginning my 25th year in Pontiac. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, this will actually be my 15th year at the same school at Harrington Elementary School. Um, the school, the students, the staff, the families, you know what? They're all so hardworking and dedicated. We all want the same thing for our students. We want our students to be successful. We want them to enjoy learning and we want them to be safe. So yeah, we're, we're all working really, really hard. We have some challenges coming up. They're gonna be working on our school for the whole year and then we'll be at another school. So. Just give us a little prayer. Um, but I'm sure with, with all the great staff and, and students that we have, we'll, we'll get through it. We'll get through it. My turn to ask a question. And I'm so thrilled to have my dear friend Kathy here and to be a partner with um, Pontiac Schools. And I want to ask, um, what is the importance of having a community partner and what is the impact that you see through our school partners program? Well, actually, the partnership has been truly instrumental. I mean, to see the kids' eyes when they get a backpack, where maybe they wouldn't have been able to get a backpack at the beginning of the school year. And not only is it just a backpack, it's filled with school supplies, and they so desperately need that. Kaleo Kids was a program that we had at our school. The kids absolutely loved this program because they got a chance to sing, to dance, to work together, to use their imagination, and best of all, they got to perform in front of the whole school. So that, that, that was really, I mean, I had tears in my eyes when we were singing the songs together and everything, it was fabulous. Um, the other thing is the library. I mean, Kensington volunteers have cleaned, organized, and set up our library um, in a situation where we wouldn't have had a library because we didn't have anybody who could work it. And the kids get to hear a story from someone other than their teacher, and they get to actually check out a book. So the kids really enjoy that. And then the other thing that we have at Harrington that Kensington has been great with is our school garden. So the original goal of this garden was that we could have an outdoor classroom. Right now I believe we have 12 beds and there are actually benches that are set up. And um, Kensington has come out and they've helped us weed it, they've helped us harvest, they've helped us plant seeds. And all I can say is thank you, because without you, we wouldn't have a lot of these things that maybe in another district they have. So thank can you. Can you thank Kathy for being here? Yes. And for just the passion and the dedication she has um, to love children. And I want to invite you to come out in the lobby afterward. Kathy and I will be out there. You can find us at the school supply donation area. And our back to school initiative will continue through the end of the month and um, the shopping cart will be online. You can pick up one of the cards out in the lobby if you want to know more information or find us on the kensingtonchurch.org slash school partners page. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
All right, we are in week seven. I can't believe how fast the summer is going by, but we are in week seven of Lessons from the Lake. And we've been walking through um, for the past seven weeks um, these parables that Jesus told using word pictures and stories to teach lessons. And today, in the shortest of parables, um, Andrew is going to walk us through um, just make simple, how Jesus made simple an idea that was just huge and complex and really hard for people to understand. So please enjoy this song and then we'll get into that. And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely? Because 
Every single week, we have incredible people, men and women, who lead us from this stage. And I'm just, just hearing Michelle to this morning, I was just reminded of seven years ago when I first stepped in to this auditorium, I was just blown away and just felt like a concert in here just because of the level of talent that is here. But let me just say, every single one of these men and women, they're just like you and me, just goofballs and we all have our ups and downs. And this is the thing, this is what I know about Michelle and the people who lead week in and week out is that yes, they have extraordinary talent. But one of the things that I love about you, Michelle, and our team here is that what far exceeds even that is the way that you desire to love Jesus and have a passion to serve people. And so thank you for serving us. Thank you for leading us today. So I'd love for you to continue to lead us if you're okay with it and just pray for us today. Thank you. I just want to say amen. Serving while broken is not an easy thing to do. Is she on? Amen. Perfect. There you go. I just want to say that serving while broken is not an easy thing to do. I lost my mom. And it's just been really tough for me to just daily go through life without her. And so I'm thankful for the love, for the prayers, for everything that everybody has given. And I just appreciate everybody. Thank you. Can we actually do this? I'd love for you. Can we actually just pivot a little bit? And would it be okay if we prayed for you? Would that be okay? Hey, would you join? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you, Lord, that these words that we just heard that Michelle sang and led us so beautifully in, Lord, they're just not words of a song, but they, it is truth about who you are and how deeply you love us, Lord, just like your eyes are on a sparrow, Lord, and how deeply you care, Lord, about a bird, Lord, about all of creation. Lord, we're part of that creation and that you love and care for us, God. And so, Lord, we pray for Lachelle and her family right now, God, as they have experienced a lot, a lot this year, Lord. And so we pray, Lord, that they would know that they are seen by the God of the universe, that you don't just see them, Lord, that you care and that you provide and will provide everything that they need. And so we pray, Lord, for Lachelle and her family today, that there would be moments of incredible joy today, that there would be a sense of supernatural peace, God, and what they need, the things that they know they need and even the things that they don't, God, that you would provide in the only way as only you can, God. And so we pray your blessing, your protection upon them. Thank you for Michelle. Lord, she's an incredible part of this community. Grateful for her, Lord, and her leadership. And we pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Okay, and then now we are ready to go. And I think that's such an important reminder for me and for every single one of us today as we enter into our day, that his eyes are on the sparrow and his eyes are on you and his eyes are on me, giving us everything that we need. And I recognize that week in and week out, there are people, hundreds of people, thousands of people who come through our doors and watch on stream and for the vast majority, for every single one of us, I look at the people who come and you all look incredibly great. Right? You got smiles on your faces, dressed really well, some of you put on deodorant and all of these kinds of things. Right? But I recognize that probably for every single one of us, we carry heavy, heavy weights. And some of us, the weight of the world because of what is happening in our lives and the lives of the people that we love. And so today that we would know that truth, that the God of the universe, that he sees us and he asks us to live in a different way. And even not just when things are going well, but also when things are hard and that he gives us everything that we need to actually live in that way. And that's really one of the things that we're gonna be focusing on today. And so we're gonna be looking at a passage that is really, really short. And so, but, and we're gonna read that in a moment. But before we do, what we also wanna do as we continue on in our service is we wanna invite the ushers to come forward. And we're also gonna receive our offering for today. So ushers, if you wanna come forward for that. And one of the things that I absolutely love about Kensington is our passion to look outside of these walls. Because when we give and when we partner together, that's one of the things that happens with our finances. Those finances don't just stay here to serve the people here, but they move out to impact students in our area and people literally all over the world. So please know that when we actually give in this way, this is one of the things that happens. And so if you would like to partner with us today, one of the ways that we can give is that we see the offering bags that are coming around, but at the same time, I know that many of us give electronically. And so if you would like to give in that way, the many a lot of electronic ways that we can partner together are on the screens. And so we want to say thank you for that. And so today we are continuing on in our series of lessons from the lake. And we're going to be looking at a parable, a story that Jesus told. And it is one of the shortest stories that Jesus communicated. And so we want to read it right off the bat. And so this is the words of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew. And he said this. He told them another parable. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. And so as Michelle mentioned, in this series that we've been in, we've looked at several of, stor of the stories, several of the parables that Jesus told. And Jesus told a lot of parables. In fact, if we look at the first three books of the New Testament, the first three gospel accounts, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, more than a third of his teachings are in the form of these stories or parables. And one of the reasons why Jesus told so many parables is, frankly, parables and stories, they're just more interesting, which make them more memorable, which is why children at bedtime, they don't ask their parents, hey, mom, dad, can you tell me some facts, right? Said no child ever. Now, children ask, Mom, Dad, can you please tell me a story? But ultimately, the reason why Jesus told stories, the reason why he told parables wasn't to entertain, but rather it was to teach and to provoke thought, to challenge us to view the world in a different way, and to bring about a change in our attitudes, our beliefs, and our actions so they were in greater alignment with God's. Yes, they were stories, but they were stories with intent. And many of the parables that Jesus told, what he was trying to do with them is he was trying to use them to explain, to describe his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And that's what he does in the story that we're going to be looking at today. And maybe for some of us, maybe for many of us, when we hear the word kingdom, it may be a concept that we're not familiar with because we don't live in a monarchy. We live in a democracy where we elect our leader. And for the longest time, I had trouble wrapping my mind around that concept as well. What exactly is that? What exactly is this thing called the kingdom of heaven? And after college, I lived in Texas for a year. And it was the first time. I grew up in Canada. I grew up in Vancouver. First time living away from home. And while I was there, I met a woman from Georgia, this tiny town in Georgia. First person I ever met from there. And one day she was kind and she was so sweet. And one day she came up to me and she said, hey, Andrew, would you like a Coke? 
And I looked up from what I was doing and I noticed that she had a Sprite in her hand. And I'm thinking to myself, she's pretty, I know she's intelligent and I know she can read. And so I didn't want to be a jerk, but I was curious. And so I asked her, you know you have a Sprite in your hand, right? And she laughed and she told me that where she was from, people refer to all soft drinks as Coke. People didn't even drink Pepsi, let alone mention it, because Coke was king. She was from the kingdom of Coke, and where she was from, Coke ruled and reigned. She was from that type of place, that type of kingdom. And it's the same thing in a lot of ways with the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is where God rules and reigns. And so if we're a Jesus follower, what this means is, is that we are a part of the kingdom of heaven because God rules and reigns in our life. Heaven is also included in the kingdom of heaven because that's one of the places, another place, that God rules and reigns. And when Jesus was on this earth, he also told us that his kingdom had broken into this world and we catch glimpses of it all around us every single day. We see it when people choose to love their enemies. We see it when people choose to respond with compassion, with humility, with gentleness, with love. We see it when people serve the poor and use the resources that they have to elevate the oppressed and the marginalized in our world. This is all evidence of the kingdom of heaven. And one of the reasons why Jesus talks so much about this whole con kingdom concept, the kingdom of heaven idea, is because he understood that the people during his time, they didn't get it in that they heard all of these rumors. They knew that they, they heard, had heard all of these stories about people saying, hey, here's our Messiah. This is our long-awaited king. And they would look at him and think, if that's our king, then where in the world is his kingdom? Because when they looked around, all they saw was the kingdom of Rome. Because at that time, Rome had the greatest military force in the world, and they had used it basically to take over the entire Mediterranean region, including Israel. And for the Jewish people, for centuries, they believed that when their promised king came, what he would do is that he would come in power and he would be this incredible military leader who would throw off foreign rule, foreign oppression, and establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. They believed that he would come, probably in their minds, riding in on a war horse, riding in on a chariot, leading this massive army. And then Jesus shows up and everyone's like, hey, that's our guy. That's the one that we, we've been waiting for. And he's poor and homeless. And he comes in on a donkey saying things like, hey, turn the other cheek. Love your enemy. And people are like, what? This guy? Right? That's the guy we've been waiting for? And so Jesus understood that they didn't understand the type of king he was and the type of kingdom he came to bring. And so he tries to explain it. And he explains it over and over and over again in all of these different ways, including in our story today. And he says, the kingdom of heaven, my kingdom, he says, is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants, and, he becomes, and, it, and it becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. And so what Jesus does is that he likens his kingdom to a mustard seed, and he actually talks about the fact that this seed, he says the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. And if you know anything about seeds, maybe some of us were botany majors, who knows, right? But if you know anything about seeds, right, you know that the mustard seed is a tiny seed. It's like one to two millimeters in length. And this is a picture of the mustard seed. It's super small. You can pick one of these. I don't know if you can actually buy one of those at Walmart, but you can actually buy mustard seeds at Walmart. I didn't buy one because I was thinking, you know what? Probably not the ones that they use in Israel, but who knows, right? They're small. But this is the thing about mustard seeds. Seeds And Jesus making the statement that it's the smallest seed. It's not the smallest seed, right? Because, because if you know anything about seeds, you understand that there are smaller seeds than the mustard seed in this world. And so why would Jesus say that when clearly it's not true, right? So was Jesus just uninformed and uneducated? Was he just ignorant about seeds, right? And some people could read this. And know that the mustard seed isn't the small seed and say, hey, you know what? This is one of the reasons why the Bible is untrue, why it's inaccurate, why we don't have to believe it. And there's an author and theologian named Klein Snodgrass. And in addition to being a brilliant human being, he also has the privilege of having one of the greatest names in human history, right? <laughs> Klein, Mr. Klein Snodgrass, please come to the front, right? So incredible name. 
But a couple, a handful of years ago, he wrote this book called Stories with Intent, which is a deeper dive into the parables. And I have it as a resource, and it has served me so incredibly well. And so if you are someone who wants to dive deeper into the parables of Jesus, that book right there is worth the investment. It'll be something that is on your bookshelf for many, many years. And this is what he says in his book about this whole issue. And he brings a lot of clarity to it. And he writes this. In both the Jewish and Greco-Roman world, Mustard seeds were proverbially known for their small size, even though other seeds, such as the orchid or the cypress, were known to be smaller. And this is a sentence that's important. Since we are dealing with a proverbial use, that's how Jesus is using it in this story, anxiety about issues of accuracy are out of bounds. That is what he is saying. It's a proverbial use. And so this is the thing that Jesus is ultimately trying to communicate. He's trying to say that the mustard seed is a tiny little seed. But one of the reasons why I believe that Jesus uses the example of a mustard seed is that the mustard seed is unique and it has the ma a massive capacity for growth in that this tiny little seed that is one to two millimeters in length has the ability to become a tree like this. A tree that is probably about 12, 14, 15 feet long. So this tiny little seed is able to experience this massive growth. And this is the thing, just a quick side note on this, right? In the first service, I actually said, hey, tiny little seed becomes that thing, that must be like one billion X growth. And everyone in the, uh, everyone who was in a part of that service, who's like an engineer, mathematician, right, immediately, red flags, all of it. Some people actually did the math. One person, I don't know if you guys can see this, actually wrote it down, and they broke it down based upon height and volume. Alan, can you get a shot of this? Maybe you can, right? And they said, based upon height, it's a 3,600 times growth. And if you want to do volume, the, the uh, formula is 4 3rd pi r cubed. And so it's 1.8 million. And so for all of you who are mathematicians and engineers, we are grateful for you, but thank you. Right? Just <laughs> sort of just trying to put it out there. Maybe 1 billion. I'm just trying to say it was large, right? Just <laughs> hyperbole right there. Anyways. So you understand, right? It's a large amount of growth. That's why Jesus is using it, right? So, but this is the thing, right? This is why Jesus, this is one of the main points that Jesus is trying to make. In likening his kingdom to a mustard seed, what he's saying is, although my kingdom may appear small and insignificant, what will eventually become is something powerful and substantial. Because remember, the Jews, they were looking for this big, bad military leader to come and to show Rome who was boss. But Jesus, he wasn't that type of king, and he didn't come to bring that type of kingdom. And he says that my kingdom is like a mustard seed. Yes, it may appear, it may appear small and insignificant, but do not discount it for a moment because you discount it at your own peril. Because there is something that you do not see, something special, something spectacular that is percolating under the surface that will eventually rise up and become a movement that will transform the world. And he actually says it right there. He actually gives us a picture using this whole bur uh, seed, tree, bird illustration. And he says that when my mustard seed actually becomes what I envision it to be, there will be birds that will come and perch in its branches. And it's a picture of peace, of refuge, of rest, of unity, of reconciliation, of togetherness, bringing the world together in a very, very different way. And Bob Goth, he is an author. This guy is a speaker. He's also a self-described recovering lawyer, also happens to be the honorary consul to Uganda, and he lives in San Diego. And 29 years ago, he and his family, they had this brilliant idea and they were so excited about it in that they wanted to begin in their neighborhood to have a New Year's Day parade. And the reason why they wanted to start a parade in their neighborhood is that they wanted to try to love their neighbors. And they realized that they couldn't love them if they didn't know them. And so, leading up to New Year's Day, they sent out all of these notices to every single one of their neighbors saying, hey, come out to this parade. It's going to be so much fun. And New Year's Day came and there were eight of them the vast majority being from Bob's family. And somebody said go, and they started walking down their neighborhood, waving to the six people who decided to come out. Year one wasn't exactly a smashing success. It was sort of a mustard seed start. It appeared small and insignificant, but this 
was the thing. There was something spectacular percolating under the surface that would rise up to become a movement. And they did this year. They didn't get discouraged. They continued to be faithful. They continued to do this year after year after year. And this past January, they just celebrated 29 years. And now, more than 500 people come out to this parade on New Year's Day. And let me just say, 500 people is pictures of their parade, their neighborhood parade, right? It's bigger than some of the parades that we actually have in our cities and towns. And this is the thing. There aren't more than 500 people who live in their neighborhood. The reason why they get so many people is because the, the people who live in the neighborhood invite their family and friends from literally all across the country, and they come. And so this thing has become a movement, a movement of joy, of love, that has impacted the lives of literally people all across this nation. And one of the people whose life was impacted was a woman named Carol. And Carol, one year, she was the queen of the parade, but then she was diagnosed with cancer. And she was unable, in that year, she was unable to participate in the parade. She couldn't even get out of bed. And so that New Year's Day rolled around, and she was lying in bed. And as she was, she could hear the sounds of the parade coming towards her home. And then she heard Bob's voice in her foyer, and so she was surprised by that. But then she was even more surprised when Bob and his two sons came into her room and with the permission of the nurse, picked her up and moved, to, moved her to her living room chair that was right in front of her living room window. And the parade, the people in the parade started coming by. And as they were walking by, they would place flowers and balloons and cards on her front lawn. People would wave and smile at her through her window. Some people even stopped at the window and shared with Carol how deeply she had impacted their life and the life of their family. And she's sitting there through tears. Remember, she has cancer. She doesn't have long to live. And through tears, the former queen of the parade waved to her friends, waved to her neighbors from her living room throne. And two days later, she passed away. That's the impact of a parade, a parade that started out with eight people. It's a mustard seed, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And this is the thing. Bob Goff is someone who has a mustard seed mentality, someone who understands that even though a movement of God may appear, may appear to be small and insignificant, that it has the ability to germinate into something powerful and substantial. And that's one of the challenges that Jesus gives us in this story, to have a mustard seed mentality, one of faith, one that sees the world in a very, very different way. And remember, almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus is talking to his people, Jewish people, who when they looked around, they couldn't see. They're like, you're our king? They couldn't see his kingdom anywhere. And they're asking questions like, "Where, God, are you even here? God, are you working? God, are you moving? Because all we see and all we feel is Roman oppression and Roman force. Where are you? And maybe for some of us, when we look at our world, we may feel the same way. We may be asking the same questions. Because when we look at our life, when we look at our world, maybe what we see is pain and misery and suffering, division, hostility. We see extraordinary injustice happening all around us every single day. And we ask, God, where are you? Are you working? Are you active? Are you even here? But this is the challenge for us. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean God's not moving. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean he is present. And the challenge for us is to see in a different way, to have a different type of vision, to have a mustard seed mentality, and that is one of faith. And this is the thing about a mustard seed. A mustard seed, if it's actually going to transform from a seed into a big tree, one of the things that it requires is that it requires water, someone to water it every day. It requires someone to protect it against harsh weather and against pests. And again, not just once, but to show up day after day after day. It requires someone to be faithful. And that's part of the mustard seed mentality as well. The mustard seed mentality is not just one of faith, but it's also one of faithfulness. And that's just simply showing up every day and doing what God is asking us to do. And back in 1974, a former U.S. Senator, Mark Hatfield, he had the opportunity to tour Calcutta with Mother Teresa. And on this tour, they visited a number of places. 
Two of them being the house of the dying, where sick children were cared for and loved in their last days. And they also went to a place called the dispensary, where people, every single day, hundreds of people would line up seeking medical care. And during, that, during those handful of days that they were together, Senator Hatfield, he actually saw Mother Teresa love, care for, and feed so many people in need. And he also shared on that trip, there were so many moments that he just felt completely overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the need, the poverty, as well as all the suffering. And so one day, he turned. He turned to Mother Teresa and he asked her, don't you ever get discouraged by all of the poverty, understanding how little you can do about it? And Mother Teresa, in her compassionate, kind way, she turned to the senator and said, my dear senator, I'm not called to be successful. I'm called to be faithful. And she had a different type of mentality. She had this mustard seed mentality and that she understood that the outcome wasn't up to her. It wasn't her job to create some type of result, but the role that God had given her was to show up every single day and simply to say yes to what God was asking her to do, to have that mustard seed mentality. And that's what God asks of us as well. Our job is very simple. Our job is not necessarily to focus on the outcome, to be overly concerned about it, but rather is to show up every single day amongst the people and in the places that God has strategically and intentionally placed us and say simply say yes to whatever he's asking us to do in that moment, in that day. It's to have that type of mentality, the mustard seed mentality. But this is the thing that I know about the society and the culture that we live in. We live in a results-oriented culture, a results-oriented society. And when we work hard at something and we don't see the results that we want or that we expect, it can get discouraging. It can be incredibly deflating. And for some of us, maybe we have done that. Maybe we have been faithful. We've been faithful for a long time. That maybe we have loved that person. We have served that person. We've been praying for that person maybe for months, years, maybe even decades. And it seems like nothing has changed. Or maybe for others of us, years ago, God gave us this incredible dream that we are so passionate about. So for the past handful of years, we have worked so hard. We have sacrificed so much to try to make it a reality. But it seems like nothing is happening and we're on the verge of quitting because we're thinking, what is the point? And if this is us, I believe the challenge that God is giving us today is do not quit. Do not quit. Because we have no idea what is actually percolating under the surface and what God is actually doing. And that just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. And this is the thing about faithfulness, right? Faithfulness is not glamorous. It's not sexy. It's not romantic, right? It's just grinding it out every single day and showing up and saying, God, what do you want me to do today? And there probably won't be a lot of fanfare, won't be people clapping and saying, hey, way to go and celebrating us. No, most people won't even see. And in the midst of those situations, can we actually do and continue to say yes to what God is asking us to do? Because we have no idea. And so often it's all the yeses, all the small yeses, that we say day after day, week after week, year after year, that ultimately add up to something spectacular and special and beautiful that God is then able to use in the end. And if we are discouraged today and we feel like quitting, let me just say, we are not alone. You are not alone, right? There's probably a lot of people here who are struggling in some area of their life an area that they believe that God has asked them to do certain things in. They're like, what is the point? I just want to quit. I want to quit in certain areas of my life. There have been people who wanted to quit all throughout human history. Even almost 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul, he was writing to people who wanted to quit. And he wrote a letter to them that's found in the New Testament, and it's called Galatians. And these people, they had been faithful. They had for a long time put just one foot in front of of the other, and now they were tired. And so Paul says these words to them. And imagine Paul writing these words to us, this community, you and me, on August 18th, 2024, in Troy, Michigan, because this is what he says. He says, so let's not get tired. Let's not get tired of doing what's good, because at just the right time, 
we will reap a harvest of blessing. We'll see the beauty. We'll see the power of what God is doing. But only if we do not give up. It's really a challenge to persevere. It's a, pal- it's a challenge to endure. It's a challenge to be faithful. Even though it's not glamorous, even though it's not easy to keep going and to make that decision today, to make it tomorrow, the day after, and the day after, and to continue to show up and say yes. That's the mustard seed mentality. But this story, so this story, it's a powerful story. And so Jesus uses it to try to explain to us his kingdom, to try to explain to us that something small can actually become something big. But this is the thing. Right, that, that can happen in a positive and beautiful way, but it can also happen in a negative, destructive way. And so this story is also a story of warning to us. Because this is what I know, and this is what probably most of us, if all of us, all of us know as well, that something small can become something massive in our life. And that something massive can be something terrible. Because how it so often starts It so often starts with just simply one compromise, with one decision. And that might be one drink, it might be one text, one meeting, one view, one Instagram account that we're following. And it's just that one compromise that leads to another compromise, that leads to another compromise, that leads to another compromise, and it snowballs. And eventually, after all of those compromises, we look around at our life and we realize that we're at a place that we never ever wanted or never ever thought we would be. Because this is, this is the truth, that every significant failure or addiction or habit didn't just develop overnight. We didn't just go to sleep and somehow find, oh my goodness, I'm addicted to pornography, I'm an alcoholic today. It didn't happen like that. We all know that. But it was one decision, and then another decision, and then another decision, and then another decision, and then we find ourselves in this place. So this is the thing, that if we find ourselves in a place, in a mustard seed situation today, that we know is headed for destruction, and it will shipwreck not just our life, but also the lives of the people around us, then the lie to no longer believe is that something small, the decisions that we make will not eventually turn into something that will destroy our lives and the lives of the people that we love the most. It's so important for us to understand that as well. It works the opposite way. And maybe for some of us, we have made those decisions Right? And we have taken those steps, and now we feel like, you know what? I am too far on this road. I'm too far down this road. And we don't even know how to get back. We don't even know how to get back to that place of healing and wholeness, that place of life. And we're thinking, how in the world, when I have taken all these steps and made all these bad decisions, I can't even see myself back there. But this is the thing. Just like where we are today, it just started with one step. If we actually want to get back to a place, a place of life, a place of beauty, a place of wholeness and thriving, it all starts with just one step as well, a step that we can take today. And the power of a step is really extraordinary. One step, and we continue to take that step, we continue to take steps, what can ultimately happen is it can actually change somebody's life. It's the power of a decision. And a couple of years ago, I, wrote, I read a book. I didn't write a book. I read a book. I really wish I wrote this book. It's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And in this book, he talks about, he uses this illustration of a plane that's taking off from LAX that's bound for JFK in New York. And he said that if you just shift the nose of that plane at takeoff just by a few degrees, right, at takeoff, no one will hardly even notice. But that small shift, magnified over the course of the entire United States, has the ability to make a huge impact. Because just shifting the nose of that plane, that just small decision, will cause that plane not to land in New York, but it'll actually land in Washington, D.C. And so what he's basically saying is, his point is, is that a decision may seem small and insignificant in the moment, but magnified over a longer period of time, it has the power, it has the ability to determine the difference between who we are and who we want to be. It's the power of a decision. And when I think about our journey with Jesus, our journey with Jesus so much of the time 
It's not about the 10th decision or the 50th decision. It's the decision that's right in front of us. The nudge, the impression that God is giving to us and saying, hey, would you take this step? Would you have the courage and humility to take this step? And the decisions that we're talking about today aren't easy steps. When we're tired, when we're worn out, when we're thinking to ourselves, what's the point, right? And we just wanna give up. To take that next step is really hard. Or if we're in a cycle of addiction, of a bad, of a terrible habit, and we've taken all of these steps, we're, and we're in that rhythm, and it's so much easier just to take another step, and another step, and another step. It is really hard to stop and to turn 180 degrees and make a completely different decision. These are not easy. But this is the thing, that we would know this today, that we are not alone in this journey, that the God of the universe is with us, is with us. And we're gonna sing a song in a moment that reminds us of this. It's Jehovah Jireh, right? It's, that's what it's called, Jireh. And that it's the God who provides and that he will give us everything that we need to make the decisions that move us more towards him and more towards life. And so what is it for us today? What's he asking us to do? What's the step that he's asking us to take? Is it to continue down this road and continuing to be faithful amongst the people and the places that God has put us in to show up to work tomorrow, to continue to love that person who just annoys us like crazy, continue to pray for that person in our life who doesn't know Jesus? Or is he asking us to also take a different step today, to no longer travel down this path that will lead to ultimately to destruction and hurt and pain, but to start move the other way, that we would tap into the God of the universe, his strength, his perseverance, his endurance, his compassion, his grace, his love, all of that is available to us. That we don't have the ability to do it, but with Jesus, everything is possible. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. That as we're gonna sing in a moment, Lord, you truly are Jaira. You are the one who provides. And so thank you, Lord, that in this journey that we are not alone. And I know, Lord, that there are people listening right now, God, who are tired, Lord, and they've been so incredibly faithful to you. Lord, serving you, loving people, all of these things, that would you please give us the strength to take that next step today. Also, Lord, that there are, I recognize there are others, Lord, that we are in a cycle, Lord, and a dangerous cycle that we have been in, Lord, maybe for months, maybe even for years, and we don't see a way out. But with you, Lord, we recognize all things are possible. And it all begins with one step that you are inviting us to take. Lord, and whatever that step is for that person today, help them, Lord, give them everything that they need to take this step. And not only to recognize that we not only have access to you, but there are also people around us that you have given us to walk with us, God, and for us to also have the courage and humility to reach out and to say, help, I need you. Lord, we as a community desire to be people who look more like you, who love more like you. Help us to do that, God. It's not easy, Lord, but with your help, again, everything is possible. And we pray these things in your name. be more loved than I am right now wasn't holding you up so there's nothing I could do to let you down it doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now Ooh. going through a storm but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out. You would cross an ocean so I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right. 
You're forever enough, always enough, you're more than enough. Listen, I don't want to forget how I feel right now on a mountaintop. I can see so clear what it's all about. So stay by my side when the sun goes down. Listen, we just want to encourage you that no matter what, Jaira truly is enough. This is the God that we serve. We've been singing about this God. We've been praying about this God, talking about this God all service. He is known as Jehovah Jaira, the provider, meaning he provides for you. 
When situations aren't bending, he provides for you. He gives you hope in hopeless situations. He offers peace in peaceless situations. He gives you love. So when circumstances come that challenge this faith, I need you to boldly declare that you can be content in every circumstance. Come on, just say it. Say, I will be content in every circumstance because you are enough, God. Hallelujah. Listen, anybody, if you want prayer or need prayer for any reason, have any prayer requests, we have the prayer team that will meet you right here in the front. And don't be ashamed. Everyone is welcome. They will be more than happy to pray for you. Also, a week from today, next week, on the East Lawn, we have our outdoor baptism service. And it's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss it. But until then, drive safely. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll see you next week.